Hello, I'm Kamla. My guest today is Dhruv Khanna. He's a lawyer and the owner of Kirgan Cellars, a hundred-year-old winery and vineyard located in Silicon Valley. Well, technically it is in Silicon Valley because Santa Clara County is what Silicon Valley consists of. And Dhruv actually combines both technology and the agricultural side of Silicon Valley. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Kamla. You're probably one of those rare human beings who's worked in a tech uh, startup and now work, is working in one of the oldest uh, wine growing regions of California, which is the Santa Clara uh, Wine uh, Trail. Yes, I, I enjoy kind of spreading myself around. So yes, I've had a lot of experience in the technology field, obviously in the legal field, and now in farming as well. Mm. What took you from the legal field and tech field to uh, embrace a, are you a farmer? Should I call you a farmer? Well, my younger daughter kids me saying, Dad, you're not a farmer. But uh, I think, you know, it's, it's really, it, I, have, I have a reasonable argument that I now am. I certainly wasn't when See, I started. See, you're a lawyer, so you're going to have a reasonable <laughs> argument. <laughs> but, but well, we, we farm 36 acres, and this is a property that's been farmed for 100 years now. So we face many challenges because the soil has been depleted. We've been farming it, as I said, for 100 years. So to some extent, I've learned a lot about farming over the last, especially over the last eight years when we replanted about half of our vineyards. So uh, we have two tractors. Uh, we have, you, are, have you driven one of those tractors? I personally do not drive the tractor. Well, then you fail the test. Well, then I fail the test <laughs> there. So it's, <laughs> we let it rest at that. <laughs> so, so you have that. Why did you have to replant? Uh, you said a few years ago you replanted. Why is that? Well, as I said, the, the, uh, the, the winery, we've got some 80 and 90 year old vines uh, on the property. Over time, the yields from the vines diminish. The optimal uh, longevity or lifespan of a vine is 40 or 50 years. So we got more than our fair share out of those vines. We've kept a few of our 80-year-old vines for historical purposes, but uh, we've had struggle with soil pests like nematodes and phylloxera. Uh, and it made sense in 2008, as the root technology became better, we have all kinds of different root stocks that are more resistant to, to these pests. So it made sense. We also put in drip irrigation, so in sort of anticipation of, frankly, of water conservation methods. So we've done a lot of work in revamping our vineyards and bringing them up to date. So part of it was, I would say, uh, replanting the vineyards was a necessity given the longevity, given how long uh, the uh, existing vines had served, and it was just time to do something new and different. Hmm. How did you get interested in a vineyard and winery. When was the first time you drank wine? You grew up in India. Well, I've tasted wine occasionally. In fact, I'd spent two months in France as well as a part of my college experience. But um, when my company went public in 1999, I was looking for another investment in 2000. And I really wanted to blend my love for the outdoors. Uh, I really wasn't that dialed into doing additional startups. So this made sense from an investment point of view, from my enjoyment of the outdoors, and most importantly, the manager, the general manager of the winery agreed to stay. So he'd worked for the previous owner for 15 years. Now he's worked with me for 16 years. His name is Alan Kreitzer. He's from UC Davis, one of the best winemakers in California, and very experienced, and he has helped me with the farming and the winemaking, and he's been a big part of the success of Kirkland Cellars. Alan himself owns a uh, winery. Alan has also purchased a winery of his own in Amador County. And the grapes there are different. It's at a higher elevation, completely different climate, completely different soil. But he still works for me at least two days a week. And uh, it's, it's a blessing for us to have access to A, to his know-how, B, to some of his grapes when we put our final blends together. So walk us uh, through the history of the winery. It's a hundred year old winery. Yes, the winery has been in continuous operation for a hundred years, always as a family owned winery. So there have been three different families who've owned it. So historically it was known as the Bonacio winery because the Bonacio family, the Italians basically owned all the real estate and farming there for years. And Kerrigan Cellars, then known as the Bonacio winery, was owned by the Italians all the way from 1916 through 1975. In 1975, Mr. Kirigan purchased the winery. Mr. Kirigan is from Croatia, and Croatia is probably the only country of the former Eastern Bloc that has a, that is really a part of the Mediterranean uh, family of countries. Because it extends from Italy, exactly. the sea coast. Yes, in fact, the Adriatic Sea is shared on one side by Italy and the other side by Croatia. So the Dalmatian coast 
uh, Dubrovnik and uh, the southern part of Croatia is very Mediterranean, has a very Mediterranean climate. So they have olives and grapes and wine making. And in fact, one of the wines, uh, the, vine, or the wines that we have, the Zinfandel, is very popular in Croatia. So this so, is the Zinfandel. Yes. This and is uh, vintage 2014. Yes, and even in California, it's not just the Italians and the French who brought their know-how to Napa. Uh, Gergic Cellars, Gergic is a uh, Croatian, Croatian winery, and in our neck of the woods, Kyrgyz, and right opposite uh, the street from us is Dorset Cellars. So uh, there is a small minor, small but significant minority of Croatian wineries, but they're very much like Italian or French wineries because they're essentially Mediterranean um, uh, uh, wineries. So culturally, they fit into the Italian side. Exactly. Their lifestyle is similar. My daughters and I visited Croatia. It's all about the fish, the cheese, olives, and uh, the Mediterranean diet, and obviously wine is a big part of it. So what was the contribution of Mr. Kirgin uh, to the winery? Because he was a... What is the word that you use for somebody who's trained? He's an enologist, right. So he was a trained enologist. Uh, he was about 57, I think, when he bought the winery. So I'm 56, so he's about my age back in 2000. Uh, he passed away a few years ago in his 90s. Uh, he, um, he knew winemaking, and he hired Alan, and Alan and he kept the winery going. Uh, it was a, a small operation, but I think he had big plans because, he, because he's left me with large uh, tanks. The tanks are now coming in very handy. Because Is that unusual? I think from my, from my perspective, it's unusual because we have only 33 acres of vineyards, but our tank capacity is large enough now because we have seen, Kirigan Cellars has seen so much growth in the last five years, we are able to accommodate that growth without having to purchase new stainless steel tanks for our fermentation. So in fact, right now it's harvest time and those tanks and that t excess tank capacity that Mr. Kerrigan left me with is a blessing. Mm. What kinds of uh, grapes do you grow there? We grow 11 different varieties. So even though it's only about 33 to 36 acres that are planted, we have 11 different varietals. We have four whites. We have a Sauvignon Blanc, a Chardonnay, a Pinot Grigio, and the Malvasia Bianca. And on the Which reds, has roots to Croatia or Italy? Well, the Malvasia Bianca, as its name indicates, has deep, deep roots in Italy and Sicily, in fact. And the original Chianti wines, in fact, use Malvasia Bianca as a blender. Uh, we we, there are six other wineries that offer up a Malvasia Bianca in California. Ours is very spectacular. It's very aromatic. It is an exquisite white wine. It's dry on the palate. Um, and the fruit is absolutely delicious. You should, you should, people should stop by our winery at harvest time simply to savor the grape. Shall we taste it to see? You said it's spectacular. Why not? Because so. it's because of the aroma. The aroma is very floral. In fact, when I uh, when I um, when you actually eat the grape at harvest time, it reminds you um, very very clearly of a lychee. So it tastes like a tropical fruit, and that uh, comes through on the aroma. So you know it's just it, it looks like any other beautiful crystal clean um, uh, white wine. Uh, but it's very, very uh, floral on the nose. And it's, uh, it would suggest that the wine itself is sweet, but it's not. So that's mm. what's so exquisite about, the wi uh, about this particular white wine is that it's floral uh, in the bouquet and on the nose, but on the palate, it's really dry. It's still fruity. It is not, not very dry. Not very, not very dry, because the fruit, the, the fruit and the character of the fruit comes through but it is not a sweet white wine. Mm. Uh, and it's certainly not, the perfume is more on the nose than it is on the palate. But it's just, it's a wonderful uh, drinking experience, I think. Dhruv, where did you learn to speak so fluently about wine? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been, uh, you know, I, I'm now increasingly involved with all the blending decisions. So uh, I've learned more about wine and I enjoy it. I think wine is, is fun to look at, it's fun to smell. And it's obviously wonderful to drink, uh, to sip. Mr. Kirigan always said you should never drink wine, you should always sip wine. And I, I sort of agree with that because I, I gave us a fairly modest pour because I don't think one should pour more wine than that at a single sitting. Ah, and okay. I think that's the beauty about the whole wine tasting experience is that it allows you to, to taste multiple wines. If you order a whole glass of wine, that's, I think, a lot. And So you never finish a bottle? I in do. one sitting? Uh, I try not to. It would be, a, a, for me, uh, even when, uh, you know, if I, if I sit down with my girlfriend and we go through a bottle of wine, that's uh, an evening of heavy drinking in my book. So you sip? I'll sip my wine, and, and I would prefer to uh, 
have multiple bottles open and, and try them, taste them against each other, uh, and progressively start with the lighter whites. Usually when I go out uh, and, and uh, to a hosted event, I will start with literally one inch of a white wine. I'll try a couple of Chardonnays and uh, I'll savor whatever else they're offering, whether it's a Pinot Noir or a Cabernet. But I try and get our, the host or hostess or the waiters to pour me uh, substantially less than a glass, more a taste, uh, and that's how I enjoy my wine. Mm. So, uh, so what, what are the other wines that you have? We, you talk so about So yes, we this. have four whites. Uh, we also have seven reds. We have a Pinot Noir, we have a Zinfandel, we have a Syrah, we have a Cabernet, we have a Petit Syrah, then we have two uh, Spanish or, or Argentinian wines. We have the Malbec and the Tempranillo. So I think I rattled them all off, but we have seven reds and four whites. How did the Malbec arrive at your uh, winery? Very good question. We have recently planted the Malbec, um, Again, what we try because we tend to associate it with Argentina. Yes, Malbecs and Tempranillo are both associated with Argentina and also with Spain. Um, we wanted to add to our wine list, and Malbecs are becoming increasingly popular. It's a very beautiful looking wine because it's got a hint of purple in it, and it's soft on the palate. Um, we just thought it was a good idea. So, and is uh, it dry or what? It's dry. Almost all of our wines we tend, to, except for our Vino de Mocha, which is a dessert wine. Um, this uh, dessert wine is, is, is one of our whites that is distinctly not dry. It's a fortified a wine liqueur. So it's in fact a red wine based uh, with orange, chocolate and coffee flavors. It's our best selling wine. Who created I'm, that? That was in fact, a, uh, that's a secret recipe that uh, Mr. Kerrigan uh, created and I inherited. And we are famous at Kerrigan Cellars for that. I don't drink too much of it at all because it's too sweet on my palate. But if you're into dessert wines, this one is hard to beat. It's also known as the kissing wine. It's also known as the kissing wine. There's a lot of romance associated with this and uh, it's been credited with uh, uh, increasing the population, world population, but I'm not sure how uh, <laughs> how uh, So this is, is Vino de Mocha. The Vino de Mocha, so uh, coffee, the coffee flavors are, are very uh, distinct uh, when, you, when you try that wine. Okay, and, but, and this is your best selling? It is our best seller because people, you know, people like alcohol, people like sweet stuff, and you, when you combine them, especially as in the fashion that the Vino de Mocha does, uh, this wine is, is very popular. Okay. But basically, I mean, I, I, I like all kinds of wines. I'm, mm. not, um, uh, I'm not a heavy cab drinker or a heavy Pinot drinker. My, my wine choices are fairly promiscuous, actually. <laughs> Got you. So you have followed a very interesting business model. You don't retail your wines. We, uh, we don't retail our wines through others. We exclusively sell our own wine at the winery. Uh, we are doing a very good job of it because the property is beautiful. The sports, whether it's soccer or cricket, we even have archery. Um, that brings in a lot of foot traffic. And if you go to a winery on a Saturday or a Sunday, the place is packed uh, and we have multiple areas open for tasting. Uh, we sell a lot of wine direct. So we have a wine club. We do lots of business on weekends. We do a fair amount of business on weekdays as well. Uh, people come. It's a beautiful place to picnic. We allow people to bring their own food. We are not a winery that discourages picnicking. We encourage people to eat. We encourage people to bring their own food. And it's a lovely place. It's, it's dog friendly. It's kid friendly. And, it's very um, Californian. Very Californian, and we, we love what we do, and we're only 45 minutes from Palo Alto, so it's, we are far more accessible than Napa or Sonoma for, for the, for the uh, Silicon Valley population. So right in the backyard of Silicon Valley. Yes, I mean, from San Jose International Airport, it takes less than 30 minutes. To reach the... To reach Kerrigan Cellars. Kerrigan and all the other wineries. Yes, we, there's, there's about 20 other wineries in our, in our area. There's Solis, there's Guglielmo, there's, and there's Clos La Chance. So there's a number of wineries uh, within five miles. There's at least a dozen wineries within a five mile radius of Kerrigan Cellars. And your wine tasting are free? We are a very old fashioned. We have uh, scrupulously adhered to complimentary wine tasting. So you get six complimentary wine tastes uh, and you can choose, we have 11 different wines. Do you get the glass? Uh, we do not give the glasses <laughs> away. Uh, but. Uh, you can buy them at a very not modest price. In the price. old days, that's what it was. You know, you went to a vineyard, it was all complimentary, and then they started charging money. Yes, a lot of wineries today in Napa and in Santa Clara as well charge a tasting fee. We do not. Okay, and why is that? 
Well, because we're old-fashioned, and what we've done is, instead of punishing our customers for our success and our popularity, what we've done is opened up more tasting areas. So we provide more parking, we provide more restrooms, we provide more bar space, we provide more staff. So we are able to respond to uh, the crush of traffic by expanding our, our services and facilities rather than punishing our customers for, 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 for loving us. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So you mentioned something, that you have cricket and soccer fields. Yes. That's unusual. You don't hear of uh, cricket, especially in a vineyard in California. Well, yes, it started with cricket, which was, that, was, that was my passion. But uh, I think it was about 2004 or 2003 when my older daughter started playing pretty good tier one, class one a CYSA soccer. And I noticed the so soccer had the same problem was that there weren't enough soccer fields. So I built some more soccer fields. So I built the soccer fields in 2005. And since 2011, when I built the parking lot, we've had kids, I've probably had a thousand soccer games, nearly a thousand soccer games there over the last five years. So it's very popular with the moms and the dads, and it's great for the winery. Somehow, I'm sure it really helps my business, but the kids play soccer there for free, and I enjoy it, and the winery is thriving. Mm. And the cricket is? The cri and for those who don't know what cricket is, how would you describe well, it? Well, cricket is the, you know, the, the baseball of, of England, the West Indies, Australia, South Africa, basically the hardcore. Um, you missed India. Well, India, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan are crazy about cricket. So um, uh, there's uh, Silicon Valley has its cr cricket partisans. I think there's like 40 teams. I myself have played cricket here pretty much continuously until about a year ago when my back and knee started bothering me. But there's a fair amount of cricket played in the Bay Area. And so your passion for cricket uh, induced you to establish a cricket field in your winery. Yes, you see the, the vines like good drainage and the flattest part of the winery was lying vacant. So I put in the, the, uh, the sod, basically, uh, the sports fields on the flattest part of the winery. So we have, so the property is 50 acres. We got about 35 acres of vineyards. We have 10 acres of sports fields, which is more than enough for two cricket fields plus you know, another uh, four uh, kids soccer fields. Some of the soccer fields overlap with the cricket fields. So we don't have cricket and soccer there at the same time, but some, you know, one day it's archery, one day it's soccer, one day it's cricket, but mostly it's soccer and because that's the most popular sport. Mm. And it's been great for business. Do you provide all the cricket equipment, uh, bat and bowl and the wickets? We can for our corporate customers who ask for it. We do provide it. But corporate generally, customers come there? Yeah, we've had a number of startups. We've had a number of established companies. We've had um, software companies, hardware companies, uh, internet companies uh, organize us. Uh, uh, we've had, finan we've had a, you know, financial companies in That I'm not surprised because a lot of Britishers in the finance yeah, industry. Yeah, so in the finance industries as well. So I'm not going to tell you any names, but there are some big names that have come uh, and enjoyed uh, a day of cricket and wine. You combine the cricket and Do the wine and the food. Do you have strict rules food. about the, that they need to wear whites? Well, no, we, we are fairly laissez-faire. We're, we're California, so we're, we're very California. So, you know, the, we, we won't tell our clients what, what, what they ought to wear and, and how they ought to drink their wine. They, they get to choose. Got you. Okay. How did you come to this country? You grew up in India, went to Dune School. Yes, and then I got a scholarship to go to England for two years. So I did my A-levels in England. Which school? Uh, at Seven Oaks in Kent, which is basically in the suburbs of Daniel Day-Lewis studied there. Seven Oaks, all the schools I've been to, I think, are, are well known for one reason or another. So after Seven Oaks, I got a scholarship to go to Dartmouth uh, on the East Coast, and then another one to go to, to Stanford to study law. So I've sort of progressively headed so west. So got, you've got scholarship throughout? Yes. I, uh, others, Which is unusual. I've been, been lucky that uh, educational institutions like Seven Oaks, Dartmouth, and Stanford have funded um, more than a preponderance of my educational freight. So. Uh, Stanford got you to Silicon Valley? Yes. So Stanford, I, I started law school. That was the first time I stepped into California. That was 1983. And I graduated from Stanford Law in 1986. So in fact, this year, it's, it's a lot of uh, reunions for me. It's my 40th year from the Dune School. It's my 30th year from law school. And Kerrigan Sellers itself has turned 100 years old because Kerrigan Sellers was founded in 1916. So it's a landmark year. It is a big year for me. I'm a very busy man this year. <laughs> okay. But it was also a landmark uh, event for you when you were doing law and became a lawyer because uh, Ma Bell had, uh, was disint uh, had been disintegrated. What, what yes. is the right phrase uh, to use? Well, really, it was carved up into the seven Bell companies. Mm. Um, and that created a lot of opportunities in the telecommunications field. So when I started out as a lawyer, uh, like most graduates from law school, didn't quite have a clear idea of what I wanted to really? do. Really? 
that I personally did not. And I sort of defaulted, the, the law firm I was with had a need for people uh, because they had new clients. Which, who which were law firm is this? A, a Morrison and Forrester. Oh, right across on Page Mill. They're on Page Mill, but at that time I worked with them in San Francisco. So their main office has always been San Francisco. So they hired me and they, were, uh, they had a need in the telecommunications space. And that was uh, very much, very much involved in government, government regulations, change in law and policies in the court system. So you're right. Ma Bell had been broken up into the seven baby bells. And uh, the telecommunications regulators in Congress at the FCC and the California State PUC were looking at how to introduce competition and have additional players. So I was involved uh, representing uh, companies, uh, Macaw Cellular, setting up its initial uh, Macaw, cell company. So that was one of my early clients. Boy. <laughs> Teleport Communications Group was another client that was setting up a fiber facility. So both on the wireless and the, wire, uh, and the landline side, I uh, cut my teeth on uh, regulatory law in the telecommunications space. And you liked space. it? I liked it. I was very good at it. I seemed to have a knack. It was kind of, it used my, 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 my expertise in economics and law. Uh, and government regulations, so it was both kind of a microeconomics kind of uh, background, and it was fun. And, and I learned about the businesses, and I learned about the opportunities, and I learned about how regulation affects the business opportunities. So in '96, I had spent three years at Intel. I was able to. What the, did you do at Intel? At Intel, I was just a part of their legal department. Uh, I was the only telecommunications lawyer in their legal department. And um, in 96, I met up with some other Intel people and other technology folks, and we started COVAD, which uh, turned, out, uh, to, turned out very nicely for me. I remember COVAD, DSL. Yes. In fact, as we were speaking the other day on the phone, that was, that's the first commercial DSL line in the country runs to my home in Palo Alto. And oh. I still, uh, I still, I still, it's still, it's still in service. Who, who maintains that? Uh, the company COVAD uh, got um, incorporated into a company called Megapath, and now it's called Global Capacity. So the, it's, the company is still in business, but its assets got acquired along the way by two different companies. And currently, it's Global Capacity. So uh, during the dot-com uh, boom, you established, you co-founded a company. Yes, our company COVAD, we went public in, our, in January of 1999. Within three years? Yes. Those were the days? Those were the days. Okay. And then what happened with COVAD? COVAD uh, went through the dot-com bust. It uh, went um, the through a chapter meltdown. 11. Yes, went through a chapter 11, but oh. it remained in business and then subsequently got acquired by private equity. And uh, it's been, its assets have been acquired uh, now, as I said, by, by two other companies. So it's very much still in business. Uh, and I uh, feel pretty proud of that accomplishment. And uh, certainly it helped, sparked, uh, progress in the whole broadband field. We had cable modems. You had improvements in DSL technology. And uh, today, Google is trying to bring fiber to everyone's homes. So that uh, challenge of bandwidth remains. You still occasionally have glitches. It's not much fun waiting for video to download sometimes on the internet. Buffering. All the buffering stuff. So it's way better than what it used to be in the dial-up days of 1994 uh, when Netscape went public. But uh, I have been, uh, I've enjoyed being a part of the broadband revolu revolution uh, and did my fair share uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s. But on a personal note, did it end well for you? Well, no, it, it ended very acrimoniously for me at COVAD. I had a falling out with the board of directors. I had a different idea of, of what to do with COVAD's money. They sought to and did invest COVAD money in some of their pet projects in other companies. And I had a little problem with that, and uh, that eventually led to a lawsuit, which uh, settled several years later. Hmm. And right after it went public, you acquired Kyrgyz uh, Sellers. Yes, uh, meaning about I think about a year, a year and a half later. I think it was mid, almost mid, two thousand by the time I acquired Kyrgyz Sellers. But yes, that was one of the benefits of having made some money after the company went public, uh, being able to invest in this. Uh, but I've really immersed myself in the winery in the last six, seven years. How did you discover Kyrgyz Sellers? Um, sort of uh, by chance. Uh, it was not being marketed aggressively at the time. And um, Were you actively was, looking to buy? I was. I was looking for real estate and we were looking at different pieces of real estate. And the only reason that Kyrgyz Sellers you know, registered with me was because the general manager indicated his willingness to stay. Uh, given my lack of knowledge of farming and the winery business, uh, to me, that was 
critical because this was a wonderful piece of real estate. It's a beautiful property. It is, um, it's a beautiful, Kerrigan Valley is what we call it. It's, it's located in a beautiful valley surrounded by hills on all sides. So it's a beautiful piece of real estate. It's only 30 minutes from San Jose International Airport. It's 45 minutes from my home in Palo Alto. So it made a lot of sense and I'm glad I did it. Mm. So, and was it easy to then for Mr. Kirgan to sell it to you because you're from India and India's, Indians are not known for being wine drinkers? <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Kirgan and I hit it off. And um, for, for whatever reason, uh, he, well, not for whatever reason, he was old. I mean, he was now in his 80s. So he was ready to sell. And it, it made sense. And uh, he, he was a very, he is, he was a very direct gentleman and he found me to be the same. I, I don't. Uh, sugarcoat or, or uh, have too much subtlety in what I say. So we got along very well and uh, as I said, I'm certainly glad I bought it from him and I think he's glad he sold it to me as well. Have you broken even? Oh, good question. It took us a while. I, I lost money on the property until 2012. So since 2012, we've been having a, you know, a, a modest profit financially, but on the goodwill side and the community benefits that we provide to the kids who play soccer, I would say it's horrendously pop pro it's, it's hugely pop profit. It was very satisfying. But yes, from a financial perspective, we turned the corner in 2012 and we, we are and will remain modestly profitable going mm. forward. Have you ever thought of changing the name of your uh, winery? That's a, another very good question. I think that's part of the reason why Mr. Kiranon likes me is that I've kept the name. My last name is Khanna. It's a very common Indian name. My first name is a little more unusual. Nevertheless, uh, we already have an investment in this name. We have a fan base. Our winemaker is the same. A lot of our vines are the same. Our, our, our Marvasia Bianca, our Vina de Mocha are the same. And um, it works. So if it ain't broke, why fix it? <laughs> okay. And uh, would you, would you, if you, if you look back, would you buy this winery? Yes, but I have to say, you know, I have to admit that when I bought the winery, I did not know that I would do with it that what I have done with it. So mm. it's been, it was a major fixer upper. It had been neglected in many ways, its facilities. I converted all the, uh, all the uh, vineyards to drip irrigation, uh, modernized the vineyards with the, the new rootstocks that we talked about. Uh, I've started the wedding business, started soccer. So all of those have, uh, measures have cemented the financial stability. And so we are very much a sustainable winery uh, and we have great confidence in our continued growth, we have the capacity for that, and we're very grateful to our customers. Dhruv, thank you for stopping by and talking about your vineyard, which is 100 years old and located right here in Silicon Valley. My pleasure, thank you. And thank you for watching. If you missed any of our shows, you can watch them on our YouTube channel, and we'll be back again with another edition. Until then, goodbye.